All right, so welcome everyone. Um, this will be our first PSP session today. So we're PS Pablo, so welcome to bed. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, today we're just gonna give you guys sort of a rundown of um, the main concepts for week one, just the high yield stuff, because that's our sort of motto. We only give you guys the important stuff. Uh, so I'll just uh, start this presentation and we'll go ahead. And if you have questions, feel free to chuck them in the chat as we go. Yeah, for sure. And we'll answer them as we go. Um, so first of all, we'll start off with um, cells one and two. So that's your first lectures. Um, and they're just going to be sort of more, sort of basic um, framework for, for cells just in future. Um, so we'll start off with um, the difference between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. So the main stuff we really know are that prokaryotic cells, you know, the bacteriums and some other sort of smaller things, whereas eukaryotic cells are more animals, plants, human cells. And um, the main differences are listed in this table. So prokaryotic cells don't have a nucleus, full stop, whereas eukaryotic cells have a nucleus. And that's an important organ. We'll get to that later. Um, pro prokaryotic cells have alternatives like single circular chromosomes and things like that. Um, secondly, we got no membrane bound organelles in prokaryotic cells, whereas membrane bound organelles in eukaryotic cells. This is going to get really tedious and monotonous quickly, but yeah. Um, next up, we've got unicellular versus multicellular. And the important distinction is a lot of people think eukaryotic cells are only multicellular, but you can have just single celled organisms that are still eukaryotic. Um, then you've got the way that they divide, and there's a distinction between them. You've got um, binary fission with prokaryotic cells, and why that's sort of an in, like an interesting thing to sort of know the difference because binary fission makes like you know exact copies and stuff like that, and you don't get that a lot of that mixing that you might get with meiosis and and and, and things like that. So that's when we get to eukaryotic cells, and I think Mitch later will talk about that in more detail. Um, another thing is that prokaryotic cells just in general are much smaller, whereas eukaryotic cells are bigger. Um, and then we've got uh, prokaryotic cells have these organelles called ribosomes, but they're smaller than the eukaryotic cells. I think it's 70S versus 80S or 60S versus 80, 70S, I can't remember. And finally, you've got that um, prokaryotic cells have these cell walls and they're quite complicated. And eukaryotic cells have cell walls as well, and, um, but they're more simple. So you've got things like peptidoglycans with the prokaryotes, we don't have those things in eukaryotic cells. All right, we'll move on. So in terms of organelles, you need to know some there are obviously more than the, just this list but not all of them are going to be relevant super quickly and they're not important in general function so you don't really need to know them in detail just sometimes in specific subunits and we'll go through them later on there um in terms of the main ones you've got the cytoplasm which is pretty much has everything in it so the cytosol is the liquid itself but then everything else is counted and so you call it the cytoplasm uh then you've got the nucleus and that's on the next slide we'll talk that, about that in detail uh, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. I'm not only joking, but like, that's literally what it is. Um, it's the it's where pretty much a lot of the different respiration sort of reactions occur, the transfer of uh, energy into met metabolites and things like that. It's really the way we sort of get our energy. Um, it also it has my, uh, my, something called mitochondrial DNA and that's inherited from mother to child. So that's just something that's really cool. Um, then we move on to ribosomes and they're pretty much the power plants, I guess, they're, they're, they're what, what make um, proteins, uh, mainly the free ones, or uh, there's, sorry, free ones, which aren't bound to the rough endoplasm reticulum, but then there are uh, ones that are bound. And the difference between these two, uh, the proteins that they make are going to be sort of different. So the ones that are free make proteins for inside of the cell, and the ones that aren't free, bound to the rough endoplasm reticulum, make proteins for outside of the cell. I think I didn't say they make proteins, but their factory is making proteins. That's just something you need to know. Um, so translation will happen there. Then we'll move on to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And that's pretty much a place where you synthesize, export, uh, and modify different proteins. And usually it sends them to this other organelle, which is called the Golgi apparatus. And that does more sort of fine tuning and, and packaging and things, which then the Golgi will send the actual proteins outside of the cell. So that's sort of the, the um, run line between all the different organelles. There's an organelle called the smooth endoplasm reticulum. And like a lot of people just underestimate how important this organelle is, but you'll see this year how like it's actually really big. Um, it's in charge of lipid synthesis, but also calcium storage. And that's really important with muscle cells, specifically skeletal muscles, like, or just, yeah, in general, because 
contract our contractions revolve around calcium and so they're going to be the stores for that so yeah that's just an organelle you probably should want to keep your eye out for then we move on to the lysosomes and they're usually in phagocytotic, phagocytotic cells so ones that engulf like bacteria and destroy them or other things and pretty much it's a, a sac which with it all these enzymes in it which just destroy anything that it fused with uh, then you've got the security secretory vesicles and they're the pretty much th uh, vesicles. Vesicles are just like sort of like packages or envelopes. So these like envelopes that go around things that are going to be sent out and they just help with that process. And then you've got the actual plasma membrane. And that is, um, we're going to talk, I think more about that later as well, but it's really pretty much the important, it's the security guard around the entire cell, it controls what goes in, what goes out. And yeah, uh, we'll move on, I guess, there. Has different components, we'll get to them yeah, now soon. Now we'll just go into more detail about the nucleus and the plasma membrane because they're probably really big in terms of anything. Um, the nucleus is in charge with um, the synthesis of DNA, so um, transcription and then getting that across. Um, it's what holds out all our genes and things called cro chromosomes, and they're just like the collections of all the genes. And you've got sort of two different forms of the chromosomes. They're called euchromatin, heterochromatin. You'll learn more about them later, later on. But they're pretty much, one of them's the form where you can sort of um, easily like translate. So the four active genes, ones that are actually being tra uh, transcribed at the moment, whereas the other forms sort of bound and it's not, not accessible. So you can't actually um, transcribe uh, from it easily. And so our DNA gets turned to one form or the other, depending if it's being used and transcribed or not. Um, yeah, you'll learn more about DNA or just the nucleus in general um, in your future lectures, I think it's week two, which is called the central dogma and that's transcription, translation, et cetera. There are cells that actually don't have a nucleus. We call them anucleus cells and uh, examples like keratinocytes and things like that, the top layers of the skin. And so you can have cells that don't that survive, you know, without a nucleus. Alternatively, you have cells with more than one nucleus. And the biggest example for that is the skeletal muscles. They just have a lot. And that's fine because they need to do a lot of that protein synthesis. So that's, they're called polynuclear cells. And then we move on to the plasma membrane, which has sort of four main components, I guess. Um, the first one is, oh, there's a question. I'm not, sorry, I'm not looking at the chat. If there are questions, uh, guys, just tell me to stop. If I haven't answered them, I haven't looked at them. But yeah, cool. Awesome. Um, I'll get to the questions as soon as I finish my bit, I reckon, just so we don't lose the flow. But um, the first component is cholesterol, and that's just something that helps with the rigidity and the flexibility of the membrane. So they're like sort of just scattered around there. There are proteins, and they're sort of in charge of a lot of different things. They they have enzymatic enzymatic functions, transport functions. They're like the um, like the transport sort of um, channels, or um, you know, then active transport facility diffusion. They've got other different functions. They help in the cytoskeleton, just things like that. And they're as well, as well as that, they're receptors for communication. You've got carbohydrates, which are more for cell cell recognition and things like that. So they're just more of a recognition sort of thing. And finally, you have um, the, the phospholipids themselves. And they're sort of these molecules that make up the entire sort of um, membrane. And we'll look at more about them later, I guess. But they're pretty much a polar head, which faces outside and because it likes the water. And that's why you have one on the inside as well. And then you've got tails, which are hydrophobic. So they don't like um, water, so they face inside. So you get that sort of membrane structure. Um, so the membrane, what's cool about it is because of all these little different things, it's selectively permeable. So it lets some things go in and some things it just doesn't let in. Um, greatest examples uh, of things it lets in are things that are lipid soluble or really small. So because it's hydro, it's got hydrophobic heads, but the tails themselves, are, sorry, hydrophilic heads and the tails themselves are hydrophobic, we can use alternative words, which are if it likes fat or doesn't like fat. We call that um, lipid, uh, it's lipophilic or lipophobic. So things that are lipid soluble can go through because the fatty tails are lipophilic and they let them through. And then you've got small things that just weave their way through. And that's like things like oxygen, just gases in general. Um, and water can do it as well, even though it's uh, something that is charged, so it shouldn't be able to go through. But uh, that means it does stop things that are big or things that are charged. So that's just something really cool about our membranes. And that's where proteins come in, which they sort of let those other things go through. Um, and I think that's it for my bit. I'm handing over to Eliza. Yeah, do you want to put on the next slide? 
Oh, is this not your slide? Or is it this one? This or? one. Right. Yep. Back, back. Oh, back. Wait, go back. That one. The one after what you just done. Yeah. Um, Sorry. <laughs> also, like, just shout out if you have any questions. Yeah. Um, or write in the chat, of course. Um, so this whole like cytoskeleton thing, when it first came up, I was like, what even is that? Like, I don't know, I didn't do bio in year 12. I don't know if it's in bio or not. But essentially it's like, just like an extra part of the cell that's like, I don't really know if it's technically like an organelle, but whatever, it's like an extra part of the cell. That's how I think of it. Um, and there's three kind of main types. So there's the microtubules, um, the microfilaments and the intermediate filaments. Um, in terms of like each of them, you learn about more specialized ones like as you go. But for now, important things to know are like the microtubules are important for um, chromosome movement in cell division, which um, we'll go through soon, I think, which is doing that part. So they're involved in the centrioles, which I have a slide on, and then the mitotic spindle, which is like mitosis and meiosis as well, we'll do later. Um, the parts involved are what you really need to know. So then like microfilaments, they include actin filaments, which are really important with like muscle um, type things. So yeah, muscle contraction. I don't know if you guys have heard of like actin and myosin, but you'll go through it like probably a million times between now and this time next year. Um, so I'm not gonna like go into detail at the moment. And then, then there's just like the intermediate filaments, which is just like another type of cytoskeleton thing. Um, yeah, next slide. So central, so they, they come under microtubules. Um, these things, they kind of like come up as like little buzzwords and then they just like come and go as you go through the course. So for now, just like have a basic idea. Um, according to Mitch, it looks like churros, um, which would be yum. Maybe if we were in person, we could actually eat churros, but yeah. Um, so they're in this like, they're essentially nine of them in like, Sorry, nine triplets. So if you can see the little, like, I don't know, if you look in the picture, you can kind of see the triplets and they look like a pinwheel. I don't know if that's like the buzzword. And they help with mitosis, which is cell division, um, by helping move other microtubules, which is the mitotic spindle. Um, yeah, we can move on. Uh, oops, I think I was going to get a picture there, but anyway. So <laughs> actin microfilaments. So they're obviously microfilament. There's a couple of different, like, main ones. I guess that we're in the LOs to know. So microvilli, they're like, I don't know if you know what villi are, but they're like the fingers in your guts that like increase surface area. So microvilli are essentially actin. They're made of actin, but they're the same things, just smaller. And they do the same thing, increase surface area um, to increase absorption because there's literally just more space for things to absorb through. Um, and then cilia are also little fingers, but what they do, it's actually really cool. You'll see videos of it in like your lectures and stuff they like more of they through like polymerization so through like making more of them they and then like going away they essentially like help um cells move it's like a little like tail thing although when i describe the flagella i'm going to actually describe that as a tail but it's like it just like comes and goes and like i don't know it's really cool um and it also helps with mucociliary clearance which is like for example in your chest you have um, goblet cells which make mucus and then the cilia like get the mucus out so like when you cough it helps like move that stuff up and so that you don't like that you can get the mucus out um sounds gross but it's actually really important and you'll learn a lot of that in immunology and then flagella is like it's literally like a long wormy like tail thing that helps move cells around and then later you'll learn again as i said earlier about actin and myosin but yeah don't worry about it for now. Okay, so now we're up to my topic, which is cell proliferation and death. So we've got four major topics in this. So we've got mitosis, meiosis, apoptosis, and necrosis. Um, so the first bit is going to be about mitosis, which if you've done, your, I think it was in your 11 bio, like you'll be all over this. Um, so I'm just going to run through it quickly. So the first stage of mitosis is like gap one. So it's a normal normal cellular growth period. Um, it's just basically normal cellular function. Some of these, some cells don't ever leave it. So neurons don't ever leave G1. So they, it's known as G0 in that case. So what happens there is you've got protein and organelle synthesis. 
the cell size towards the end, it will double. So it's basically like doubling the cell content. So when it splits into two, it's got two normal size cells in there. Um, and two important things which will come up um, in the first bit of this um, semester that you're in now is um, RB and P53. And these, are, these will come up in when you start doing a bit on cancer because what these are, are there, um, these are cyclins and CDKs which determine progression. So if, if you get to the end of GAF1 and you have P53 present, present, that's basically saying stop. We're stopping the, stopping the cell cycle and this cell will then enter apoptosis because something is wrong. And so we can't, we can't allow this to continue to grow. And then RB, so if RB is active, it's basically saying stop. We're not gonna let the cell keep going because there is something wrong so we're going to abort mission and go into apoptosis instead. So they're what's called um, they are they are what's called um, negative regulators because they if they are present they stop the cell from continuing. Um, and your question, Ali Shaban, if neurons never leave G one, how do they replicate? I'm going to be honest, we don't, I don't know yet. Um, if you want to go on a long Google search, which will probably lead you down into the never, never, you can find that out, but we haven't done that yet. So okay, I'm okay, sorry. Thanks. <laughs> um, yes, go, sorry, go. Um, so since this is the next, so you might also know this is S phase and this is where DNA is replicated. Um, again, DNA replication, if anything goes wrong, it will be like checked and checked again. And if anything goes wrong, the cell will enter apoptosis rather than continuing. Um, so in this phase, like the sister chromatids, you know how it's kind of like that. They're held together in the centromere. And then this other regulator called S-cyclin, this is, um, this prevents new complexes from forming. So once they've, once they've replicated, it will stop once they've replicated once, this S cyclin stops them from being replicated again, so you don't have too much genetic information in the cell. Sorry. Um, and so this next one is mitosis. So GAT2 is basically just like preparation for mitosis. And then the next phase is early prophase. So the cells are now considered 4N, so they've got, so they're 2N when they're normal. And now they're considered 4N because they've got double the genetic material that they would normally have. And so this is when the chromatin condenses and you can start to see those chromosomes forming like this. And then you get to late prophase, which is where the nuclear envelope disappears, the nucleoli disappear. I've got a picture of this afterwards and the spindle form. And this spindle is what um, Eliza was talking about earlier with the centrioles and the mitotic spindle. This is, the, this is that same spindle. And then in metaphase, this is where the chromosomes are most condensed and they're like lined up along the equatorial plate. And this is where you can take a karyotype, um, which is just basically like a stain that you can take and you can, like they can take all the chromosomes and put them out on a plate and you can see the karyotype of someone and that's used to determine some um, genetic diseases. And anaphase, so anaphase is where basically I think anaphase apart, metaphase middle. So they're in the middle in metaphase and they're going apart in anaphase. So this is, these centrioles are working to shorten the spindle fibers. And because they're attached to the middle of the chromosome, they basically pull everything, pull the chromosomes apart. And so you get two, so they, sorry, they pull the sister chromatids apart. So you get two chromosomes migrating towards each pole of the cell. And then in telophase, this is where um, you get the two kind of new cells forming and then the, everything kind of reappears again. So you get the nuclear envelope reappearing, the nuclear layer reappearing, and then the kind of a furrow forms around the cell and then the cell breaks apart. So if you go into the next slide, I've kind of got a good diagram of all this. So here you can see in mitosis how they're kind of, um, sorry, in early prophase, it's kind of all there. And then in late prophase, they're all condensed. And then in metaphase, they've met in the middle and you can kind of see the spindle fibers um, meeting the chromos chromatids in the middle there. And then anaphase, they're breaking apart. Telophase, they're actually separating into two different cells. So that was mitosis. And now 
meiosis. So this only occurs in germ cells. So cells which are the protogen, protogen I think that's the word, the ones that make egg cells and sperm cells. So, um, so, so when non-disjunction events occur, so basically something goes wrong, um, something goes wrong with the genetic material, anaploidian cells happens, and it's basically just terminate. Most of the time, it's terminated, but then that's how you get like genetic um, diseases from birth. Um, some of them, anyway. Um, and then genetic variation occurs in three different points. So it's through crossing over, independent assortment of chromosomes, and random fertilization. And at the end of meiosis, you have these haploid cells. Um, so just quickly about oogenesis and spermatogenesis. So oogenesis is producing eggs. So you produce, so from the protogenated germ cells, you produce one egg and three polar bodies. So this is interrupted from prenatal to puberty. So basically this is saying it doesn't happen all the time. Um, An oocyte contains all the proteins and stuff to the support of the embryo. And then the polar bodies are basically like these like they're not cells because what they've done is they've transferred all of their contents to the oocyte. So you get one massive oocyte and three tiny polar bodies. And then in spermatogenesis, you get four equivalent. So that's the one of the difference is you get one big egg and then three smaller polar bodies. And in spermatogenesis, you get three, four equivalent spermatids. And this occurs um, uninterrupted from puberty onwards. So this is kind of a picture of, um, yes, I mean, that is correct. It means produce. That is a good thing to learn your Latin suffixes because it kind of makes everything make sense. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, so this is mitosis one, meiosis one. So it's similar to mitosis because you can kind of see like what we just talked about. Are there, like in prophase one, it's they're all condensing and they're um, the difference is in prophase one crossing over occurs. So you have the actual chromosomes will cross over and then sometimes when they're crossing over, rather than them both coming back out the same way they came, the some bits will go this way and some bits of this one will go the other way. So there'll be different chromosomes. Um, and then, yeah, this is kind of very similar to um, mitosis. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide which is where it gets different. So because in the first slide, you've made basically two, two N cells, this time you've got a two N cell and you're making it an N cell. So you can kind of see how this all happens again. It's, it's a similar, similar process. So I'm not gonna go into it too much, um, but you can see how they've gone from, this is a normal to, so rather than starting with double the genetic information, you're starting with the normal amount of genetic information and then you're ending with half the genetic information. And so that's how um, this meiosis works. So you can kind of you can kind of follow the diagrams. It's pretty um, self descriptive based on what I've said before. So I'm just going to move on. Um, so the next one is apoptosis. So I kind of hinted at it before. So when some this is basically when something goes wrong with the cell. The cell says, no, we're not going to continue dividing. We're just going to stop and we're going to um, basically terminate so that you don't get um, cancerous cells forming. So there's six steps. This is a lot of information, um, but you can kind of see it on the diagram as well. Hopefully that will help. Um, so it's programmed regulated cell death. So this is a normal process, which is a good thing to happen in a normal amount. So basically what happens is the shells like shrink and round and like the cytoskeleton that was talked about before, that kind of breaks down. And then the cytoplasm um, is dense and tightly packed. And then the chromatin, which is the genetic information, it rather than being um, condensed into like normal legs, um, the normal chromosomes, which look like this, they come into compact patches called pyknosis. And then the nuclear envelope becomes discontinuous and the DNA, DNA inside is kind of all fragments up, which is carrier axis. And then blebs form, which are these little, these little um, blebs or apoptotic bodies. This is what they're also called down the bottom. That's what a bleb is. Um, and then basically the cell breaks into these blebs and then they are then phagocytosed by um, phagocytotic cells, which we will talk about more later in the semester when you're in immunology. 
And then the last one is necrosis. And this is not good. This is very bad. Um, so it's caused by factors external to a cell or a tissue. So it might be an infection. It might be a stab wound. It might be any injury or like a burn or anything. So this isn't controlled. And so it can be very damaging. So rather than, so rather than the cell or the cells all coming up nicely and forming into them little cells, they basically just explode open and release all of their contents into the um, interstitial fluid and that causes inflammation. Um, so when then that will cause, that's what causes redness, heat. Um, so yeah, necrosis is not good. Apoptosis is good. Basically the sum up of my, that part. Um, but yeah, so it's uncontrolled. Cool. That was everything. If you have any questions, type them into the chat and I'll try and answer them. Okay, so I'll be talking about the medical interview, which is basically what you do for a lot of the start of clin skills in SEM1. So kind of picture yourself going to a um, GP clinic and a patient comes in and it's kind of the types of questions you would ask them when they first come in in order to get an idea of why they've decided to come in. Um, yeah, you'll cover it for like weeks. They literally go over the same thing a lot. Um, but it's really important because when you have like your OSCEs, if they do them this year for you, then you like need to remember these steps. If you can remember like the guide, it'll really help you to make sure that you cover all the necessary points. So on the next slide. Okay, so there's three main sections in order to start the medical interview, like the first part of it. And the first, we'll go through each of them. Um, the first one is like initiating. So that's when you have to like ask, um, talk, tell them about confidentiality and ask for consent, all that good stuff. Then you need to get their identifying data, which is where you find out more about them. Make sure that like you know the patient that you're seeing and like they're in the record of that. And then um, the third part is the most important part in terms of getting an understanding of why they've come in. And that's like asking them about, their symptoms. So if we start with the first one, this is all about initiating the interview. And honestly, the biggest tip is just like memorize the order that you're meant to say these things. And that confidentiality paragraph, which is in italics, they just recommend that you memorize it to make sure that you, um, like to make sure that you always touch on all the right points. Cause it's pretty important. Um, so if we start with introduction, that's where you would go like, hi, my name is Isabel Sinsipa. I'm a second year medical student. Um, your GP has asked me to come in today and ask you a few questions about why you've come in to the GP. So just like a really short sentence explaining what you're doing. So the patient knows who you are. Then you would go through and literally recite this paragraph because it's like, I, think, I don't know if it's, a, yeah, I think it's like a law thing that you just got to say it and then you would obtain consent. So you would ask them whether they're happy to continue with the interview. Um, so yeah, like just memorize the confidentiality paragraph. Then once you, once they say, yeah, like, great, um, that sounds good, you would move on to getting their data. So of course, when you enter the room, you might have already um, ask them for their name, which is totally fine. Like the order is kind of up to you, figure out whatever flows for you. But then when you get to this part, you have to make sure that as you are conducting it, you do get all of this information. So of course you want to get their full name, their date of birth and age, their occupation. And their occupation is a really good one as well to keep in the back of your mind for when you're doing questions later for example in year one you'll do like the lower limb and um, let's say someone comes in with like a sore knee if they've just told you before that they're a gardener it's really important to write that down because it's a potential that um, like they've been putting a lot of pressure on their knees throughout the day at work and that might be part of the reason that they have had um, this knee issue so just always think about how things link together and then um Point four is super important. You have to ask it every single time. Um, and again, the easiest way, just remember the wording of this so that you get it right. Um, you have to, it's called the ATSI status, but you always have to ask the patient whether they're of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander origin. Um, if they say yes, then like there are 
you wouldn't have to do anything in that moment. But basically the reason we ask that is because in hospitals they have like Indigenous health liaisons and things like that, um, like services that they can access. And so it's really important to ask that, especially if you're doing your OSCEs, because that's like when they're marking your OSCEs, they're checking off a criteria. And so if you don't say that, they'll be like, um, uh, you've missed that point. And yes, as Lily said, if they say yes, ask them um, whether they're Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander or both, just to get as much information as you can. Okay. And then once you've got all the information, this is the most important um, part. And this is an acronym that you will use so often, and it's WWQQAAB. Um, and basically, if you can memorize the acronym and know what we'll go through now, of course, what each letter stands for, um, you'll make sure that whenever a patient comes in, you cover everything that's important. So for, I'll go through it and let's pretend that a patient has come in with a sore knee. Let's use that example. So the first thing you'll want to do after you get their information is ask them about their presenting complaint. So that can be as simple as just saying, hey, so like what's brought you in to the GP today? And they can say to you, okay, like I've had a sore knee for the past couple of weeks and I figured it would be good to get it checked out. And from there, that's when you would want to go into following your WWQQAAB. So to start with, and again, the order is flexible. Um, so the order is flexible in that you can do the when before the where, if that works. And what we'll do is Lizzie is going to be a patient. So I'm going to ask Lizzie these questions as if she were the patient coming and we'll see how it would work in terms of like the flow. Okay. So I've just asked Lizzie, I've said, why have you come in today? And she's told me, what, what do you say, Lizzie? Why have you come in today? <laughs> But a sore finger. A sore finger. No worries. And what finger in particular have you found has been causing you pain? My left pinky finger. Great. So that's the first W. So that's your where. You've found that it's the um, le the first, the right pinky. Is that what you said? Left. The left pinky. <laughs> so don't be like me and actually. Also remember down. to ask if it's right or left. And also always whenever they say, whenever you ask them like, why have you come in? Always say, can you tell me a bit more about yeah, it? Yeah, totally. They'll, and then they'll go on like a whole, they'll go on like a 10 minute rant. They'll just, especially when you have um, inclined skills, they'll give you simulated patience and they love talking. They just go on forever. So you find out where, and I would go on to also ask, and is the pain throughout your whole pinky or a specific part of it? Yeah, just my whole pinky. No worries. So then I would move on to the second W, which is when. So I would say, when did you first notice that this pain arised? Um, well, I was playing basketball and then I got fucking sore. So we got sore when she was playing basketball. You could also go on to ask, did the pain occur all at once? Like, was it an immediate pain or was it after the game you started to realise that it was a bit sore? Um, just like in the middle of the game, it came on all at once. Then... Another really key question that's important to ask, which isn't directly explicitly in WWQQAB, but it would work well here, is you could say, when you noticed the pain arised, were there any circ the word is circumstances? So was there any circumstances that occurred at the time? For example, was your hand hit or were you shooting the ball? Yeah, the basketball just like came and like smashed my whole pinky finger really hard. Yeah, and that's really important to ask because if you hadn't asked about the circumstances, currently the case that you have is that suddenly she's playing basketball and she's just got a sore pinky, but you really need to sometimes get out the important information from the patient. So then you would go on to the first cue and you, and again, the order, you can change it up, but this usually works pretty well because you would say, when you first notice the pain, how would you describe it? Would you say that it was more sharp or dull? Definitely sharp. So a sharp pain, no worries. And if you had to rate the pain on a scale from one to 10, what would you say? Probably an eight. So she's, that's, we've just done the quality and the quantity and she's rated it an eight out of 10. So you should be thinking, okay, that's pretty bad. Um, and then you could say, since noticing the pain, the pain, on your pinky, has there been anything that's made it feel better? 
Yeah, well, I put some ice on it and that felt quite nice. And have you been taking any drugs, for example, Nurofen or Panadol to make it feel better? No, I haven't. No worries. And has there been anything that's made the pain worse in the past week? No, not really. Just maybe if I move it around. So move, and that's really important as well to know that every time she moves it, it's going to make it worse. So then we would move on to associated symptoms and we would say alongside the pinky, for example, is have you noticed anything else has been in pain or any other symptoms that have accompanied with it? No, not really. So from that, we have a pretty good base understanding of what's going on. She's told us that she's heard her pinky playing basketball. The basketball hit it pretty hard and she's got a sharp pain, which is about an eight. So that's like a pretty, and it's only been, helped through the use of ice that's a pretty good base introduction and that's kind of all like as a baseline what you need from this part because what you'll learn later on is you would go in for example if it's her pinky you would go in and ask specific questions that you'll learn about the upper limb exam but this is kind of just to start getting an understanding of what's going on so someone's asked a question. If a patient asks what is a zero and what is a 10, how can we define the pain levels for them? Um, kind of, of course, it's going to be like really dependent on the patient. You could even just say like um, 10 being the worst pain you've ever experienced and zero being no pain. Or you could even, in terms of quantity, if they're finding it difficult to quantify it in numbers, you could ask them how bearable it is. Like, do they find themselves... Um, noticing it when they're doing everyday tasks, things like that. Um, it's not like you need a specific number. It just sometimes having a number, like a scale, helps the patient. Thank you. No, all good. Sense. Okay, so if we move on to the next slide. So we've just done WWQQAA, and now we're up to the B. And the B, it's so annoying, they always do this. The B is a whole another acronym in itself. So some people say WWQQAA BICE. I just say B. Um, but the B stands for BICE, which is another one. And so once you've kind of obtained the information about why they've come and the actual more medical side, these are some really important questions that you need to ask them. Sometimes when you're practicing doing cases, these can seem really like awkward to ask. Um, in terms of the fact that the patient's sitting there like, what do you mean about my beliefs? But especially when you're doing OSCEs, they're really important because they will be making sure that you do the bias. So Liza, if you want to be my patient again. Yeah, so and also I just was going to say the acronyms like sound really silly and faculty like love acronyms. This is like WWQQAA bias, whatever is actually a good one. And like, yeah, it actually it. sticks though. Like yeah. I will never forget that. <laughs> The other ones are, some of them are ridiculous, but this one's good and important. But yeah, so I'll be patient now. Once I finished asking about her symptoms, I would probably, you always want to like guide them through what you're doing. So I would probably say, thank you for pro providing that information. I'm just going to ask you a few more questions about um, the pain, if that's okay, or about what's brought you in, if that's okay. And they'd say, sure. And then I'd start by saying, so what do you think may have caused your pinky to become sore? I don't know, maybe I've broken my finger. Maybe you've broken your finger. Yeah, that could definitely be the case. And I'll pass that on to the GP so we can do the necessary tests. Then you would move on to I and you would ask them, and this pinky pain, how has it been impacting your daily life? Have you been able to continue with your daily activities? Well, I'm a tennis player and I can't really like hold my racket and it really hurts when I play tennis. So yeah, I can't train. Yeah, and that's why that is a really important question because that's important to note as well. If it's like impacting their career and their everyday life, um, of course, if, even if it's not, you need to get it checked out. But that would be something that is really important because you know that they need to get their pinky back to like optimal condition. Then you would go on to say, and what are your concerns about um, your pinky pain and how you're feeling at the moment? I'm really worried that if it doesn't get fixed soon, then I might, I don't know, miss out on the next tournament. And yeah, that's a really valid concern. And I'll definitely make sure that we can make the process as quick as possible in order to make sure that we can get it better. Again, you always want to like, I just make these up on the spot, but you use them every single time. You always want to be like throwing in um, reassuring lines because it helps the patient feel as though like you're listening to what they're saying. 
the last one I find is pretty important um, in that like, you know, imagine like you're going to the GP and you're like feeling sick. You want to feel like the GP is going to be doing something to make you feel better and expect asking about their expectations is a really good way to do that. So you would say, and what do you expect to gain from your consultation with the GP today? Well, I really just want an x-ray. Right. So, really yeah. So if you, once they say they want an x-ray, of course, you're just a medical student. So you wouldn't say, great, I'll go order you that, like go get it done, come back. Because sometimes when you're like playing in the role, you're like, I'm ready the GP. But my favourite line is like, no worries, I'll definitely pass all this information on to the GP and she'll see or they'll see what they can do from there. Um, so this is like the basics of just the presenting complaint. So up to now, you should have a good idea of why they've come in and a bit more information about their complaint. And that's probably what you'll look at in clean skills for like the first couple of weeks. And then what you move on to is looking more at their history. So you got to ask them about like the medications they're on or their family history. Obviously with a pinky injured in sport, it's less likely to be associated with, for example, a family history. But if they've come in with like a random finger pain and you find out that they're family has um, history of like rheumatoid arthritis that might be really important in being able to further diagnose them I think that was was that my last slide I think so. no oh yeah so I just put this in as well um, which is super helpful and I use this whenever I'm taking histories like when I'm doing sim patients so in your OSCE you can't take anything in with you so you would have to like write this out as you go but this basically highlights um everything that you need to cover so we've so far only looked at the left hand side and what we'll do in like the next couple of weeks is also look at the right hand side and I really like this because it's like an easy layout which makes sure that you touch all of the points that you need to cover cool all right Sam so I'm doing body fluids Fun fact about this actually is um, we had a, this was one of our first lectures they had live streamed and our lecturer was like using a camera from above and it kept zooming in on him. He got like super frustrated. Anyway, he just like left the lecture halfway through. So um, it was a bit confusing that way, but um, I think the lecture you'll have on it, especially if it's Chris Wright, it's super awesome and he really goes through it to make sure you understand it. At first, I was initially like, WTF, like, what is happening? I'm so confused. Should I drop out of med? Not nah, jokes. But um, it actually, especially when you revisit lots of these things, it becomes a lot more, like, a lot clearer. And also, you kind of realize that there's only, only thing that's actually really important is what happens to a red blood cell when placed in, and we will find out what is happening. So could I have the next slide, please? Hey, yeah, so just how I've done these slides um, is that if it's in bold, kind of like it's important. If it's in yellow, very, very important. So just like maybe memorize that. I think especially all of physiology because anatomy, you can memorize things, it's fine. You don't really need to know application because it's all kind of almost rote memorization. With phys, try understand actually like what is happening why are these like what are these forces or how can it like what is why do these things do that because then you can actually apply it to situations that matter and then that will just ultimately make your understanding better yeah and as i said you don't need to know anything really in crazy detail okay so on the left on the yes thanks on the left is um Kind of just, it's important for this one, but just kind of in life in general, like what molecules can actually go into the cell, what molecules kind of stay out and kind of what, how they cross over. So as it says here, um, all about water. So water is super vital, as I'm sure you all know, to our survival. Um, what it is to say. Yeah, exactly. Um, Sorry. So water is 60, around 60% 60 of body weight, like changes depending on like male, female and like other things. Then if you imagine like all of your bo body water, that's then split into categories of either intra or extracellular fluid. So if that 
if you actually think about each word, it's like intra is inside cells and extra is kind of like outside the cells in kind of the environment in which the cells like sits in and stays in. So um, just know that kind of breakdown of where that water is and we'll kind of return a little bit to this intracellular, extracellular fluid vibe. And the water can easily pass through the cell membrane. Yet what is important as I've got here is that not everything can. So if not everything can pass through, we then have to think about where is the water going to go and how are we going to make these concentrations of kind of all these ions and molecules that are going to allow our chemical, um, all the like kind of chem chemical reactions in our body to take place. So let's figure out what's going to happen there. Have the next slide, please. Yeah, so what's important to know is that not all solutions in the body have the same concentration. So kind of in some parts of the body, concentration might be higher than others. But we have this term osmolarity. You can use it in kind of conjunction with osmolality or something like that, but like, don't worry about the difference. So osmolarity is like the concentration of both things that are being diffused and things that have, sorry, things that have dissolved and things that hasn't, haven't actually dissolved yet. However, solutions always try to find balances. So what you'll find out is that lots of things in life try to find like a balance or an equilibrium between kind of maybe on one side of the cell wall. Is this cell wall, we've got some people here, some people here. So this is going to influence where the water goes. We also have, so one of the ways that kind of an ion can move into a cell or just like vibe where it has to go is through diffusion. Think about, you know, making cordial, you pour some syrup in. Initially the syrup stays in one space, but over time because of the movement of water and the ion, the whole cup is going to end up looking the same color. However, that's in a, just a cup of water. If you imagine then you have a guard, let's think of the guard as the guard is the um, cell membrane. So it's not going to let all of maybe the red cordial through, or maybe it only restrict certain things. So then we might have a super dilute red cordial side over here, but nothing over here. And then maybe where should the water go? So we're going to slowly um, kind of figure out all these processes as we move through the slides. But important words to know, osmosis, the process of water moving from one side to another to kind of establish that balance so that there's even concentration. And if you, if we use an example of not, red cordial, but M&Ms, so M&Ms can't pass through that wall. It establishes this force, which is known as tonicity or osmotic pressure. And we're gonna kind of work out where that goes um, later on. So we can have the next slide. If this is not making sense, it's super fine, because as Isa and I've said already, like when you go through the lectures, it'll make more sense. And also sometimes like concepts, like you don't understand that you wake up in like two days time and just like, clicks. All right, so we have these sugar molecules over here. Oh, I can't, can't see my thing, but it's dissolved in the solution and this semi-permeable membrane, which means a membrane that's only permeable to certain things. So for example, the water is able to pass through, but the sugar molecules, if you can see kind of the gaps in the membrane, are way too large to pass through. As we know, water really wants to make kind of a balance. So it wants to balance one side out with the other. So if you could even just do like simple maths, we can tell that it's way more dilute on the left hand side and a lot more concentrated on the right. So the water is like, you know what, I want to make sure both sides even. So I'm going to establish, I'm going to move towards the other side. I'm going to go down my concentration gradient and try to dilute the right hand side. So on the right hand image, that's what we have essentially. They're both trying to balance out so that it's almost exact, essentially the same or like whatever the um, equilibrium great, uh, coefficient is for that specific thing. It's trying to even that out on both sides or on one side of the wall compared to the other. So we imagine the water is lifted up on that side. There's also that gap there of the gap on the left-hand side that is not filled with water is essentially, yeah, awesome. That's essentially the osmotic pressure. So that is the force. Osmotic pressure, pressure is the force required if you have to push down the right-hand side to make it even with the other side. So just think about that. Water moves and therefore water is creating a force, especially if it was in a sealed kind of container. We go to the next one as well. So this is, yeah, sorry. Do we miss a slide? 
No, okay, but yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, I think we might have missed one. So we go back one. Yeah. This should be the next one, because then after that you go on to the Tennessee, or do you want me to switch them around? Was it so Tennessee is the next? No, that's so fine. Okay, so. Here's just hopefully this will kind of make sense what I've said. So osmolarity is the mole per volume of solvent. So it's the total, total amount of solute in a solution, both dissolved and non-dissolved. So for example, you put some salt in, some of the salt dissociates into NaCl plus Na ions and Cl, so sodium and chloride ions. But some of the salt might not dissolve but that still counts towards the, that osmolarity of the situation of the um, solution. Osmosis is water moving to an area where there is an impermeable solute. So moving to an area where it wants to dilute kind of that solute to kind of even it out across both sides. Osmotic pressure is kind of that putting that into action of what we said before the, the um, four. So the pressure gradient is caused by the difference in the non-diffusables. So non-diffusables so known as effective osmols are solutes that do not move across the membrane and they thus exert an osmotic pressure. So what we said just before, I'm just going, these will be things that are kind of stuck in one environment. So these are things like the charged um, substances like the NaCl and will be actual ions of them and we'll find out more as we go. Um, do I have any questions at the moment or is it almost too over your head? What are people vibing? All right, we'll continue then. Literally feel free to send me any messages after as well. Okay, can we continue? So tonicity is the osmolarity you get if you only count the non-diffusible. So before we were talking about salt, you know, diffusion, all that stuff. So this is, I kind of actually talked about this a bit, but that's fine. We'll just pretend I didn't. So this is things that kind of get stuck and the water is trying to balance it out. Chris Wright, I think, said it's not actually about like the water trying to dilute it to both sides, but like that's how I like to think about it. I think it makes it a lot easier to understand. Like we want to have an even concentration or even concentration of what it's meant to be in both areas. Therefore, the water moves towards those areas to kind of dissolve it. Okay. Um, and yeah, the movement of water establishes a pressure known as the osmotic pressure. And if you see in this little YouTube Thing down the bottom, um, one side kind of lifts up um, and one side kind of goes down, which you'd be like, why does that matter? It actually matters if we go and put it in like a red blood cell, which has a limited kind of capacity of volume it can take. So if we go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so this is just saying, so non-diffusables or effective osmols are things that are stuck. So we have some things that can easily pass through the cell membrane like urea, like water, like what else can, like carbon dioxide, things like that. But there's some things that are stuck on one side, which is classic example is the sodium ions. And this is the sodium ions are actually, or the things that are stuck, the things that actually generate like a force or a pressure. Next slide, please. Right, so these are the relevance and this is where we get some yellow things, I will go into detail of each one. So these exchanges of fluids happen everywhere. And if our water balance is, is like changed or, you know, we need to increase our body water or things like that, these are kind of solutions that we can give people to make them feel better um, and kind of even out where all this water is. So important to know is a red blood cell has an osmolarity of 300 milli osmoles. I think that's per milliliter or something like that. Water has zero because that makes sense. There's nothing in that water. There's no, um, there's no um, effective osmosis. There's nothing trapped or would be stuck in one side or another. And then we have saline, dextrose, and urea. Remember also the percentages of these because sometimes they might try to trick you. So they might put like 9% saline and you don't realize. And then that kind of changes everything. Important one to, yeah. Important one to realize is that 5% dextrose has an osmolarity of whatever initially. 
So this changes as it stays in the water. So could we get the next one, please? So water and urea, this is like, I've done exclusion because that will literally happen to your red blood cells if you put them in water. So never give anyone water or urea and like through IV. It's just a dumb thing to do because their blood will literally burst. If we think of a red blood cell, it has 300, I'm just going to say 300 parts because it's going to be easier. If we have so 300 things are stuck inside that red blood cell, water is, if we put it in a bath of water, it's just going to be around here. It's going to be like, you know what? I'm slightly confused. Pieces of that are not water. Essentially, yes. And then tonicity, which is different, is the things that are dissolved in water, yet they actually are, might be stuck in a slight. Um, in the area, if that makes sense. Yeah, osmoles, yeah, or the moles. Um, sorry, back to the water and putting the red blood cell in a bath of water or urea. Because there's, I'm just saying 300 parts, 300 parts that are stuck inside the red blood cell, the water's to the side. Water is gonna try rush into the red blood cell, which is here, because it wants to kind of make the concentration gradient in here even to what's in here if that makes any sense so it's going to rush in and it's going to explode the red blood cell because it can't take that much pressure because remember when water moves it takes with it like volume but also exerts like a force and pressure this is the same with urea because even though urea has a tonic has an osmolarity of 300 because os because the urea can go straight into the red blood cell because it's not a non-diffusible because it goes straight in, so it diffuses into the red blood cell, it then will explode um, because the tonicity and osmolarity are different. This point will make more sense when he explains it to you in um, the lecture, but essentially do not give anyone water or urea. It ends in an explosion. So have the next question, please. Okay, saline. 0.9% saline is isotonic to a red blood cell because you're gonna have 300 parts in the saline, 300 parts in the red blood cell, and the water is happy to go kind of between the two and nothing will happen. You're just gonna, um, if, you, if you remember from a couple of slides before, we said that the sodium ions cannot cross the cell membrane. They're gonna be stuck outside the cell. The water is happy to chew with it. Therefore, it's gonna, if you give someone 0.9% saline, which is isotonic, so the same tonicity as the red blood cell, it will increase the extracellular fluid. So water, because you're giving someone water, it's, the water is happy to chill outside, the, outside because it's the same tonicity as the cell. You're gonna increase the amount of water in the extracellular fluid. Yeah, so that's, we're all good. We're chill there. And then this is kind of the fancy one. That's like it's done this area. Initially, dextrose is isotonic. So we can think of this as essentially like sugar or glucose. At first, there's going to be no net movement of water. So it's the same as the sodium, as the salt solution before, the saline from before. We have 300 in one, 300 in the other. Okay, so water is happy just chilling between the two. Yet slow, slowly this water is metabolized, sorry, the sugar is metabolized into water and carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide can then go into the cell and so can the water diffuse across the membrane slowly, but it doesn't create a lot of pressure. So it's pressure that it can be taken. Whereas if we put the red blood cell in a bath of just water, it fully explodes because it's gonna be a rush of water. But if you do it with, um, dextrose, 5% dextrose solution, it's going to slowly go in and it can be balanced while that happens. So this is good. As that happens, because it initially it's isotonic, so it increases the extracellular fluid, the water around the cell, because the water is happy to stay either with the kind of sugar solution and go into the cell as well. So it's isotonic. We're going to increase 
the extracellular fluid. As it's metabolized, the water goes into the cell and thus you increase the intracellular fluid as well. So if we're increasing extra, extracellular fluid as well as intracellular fluid, if we remember that's what makes up our total body water and thus our total body, body water will also increase a lot. I think that is the end of my slides. Oh yeah, okay, summary. So these are the super high yield things. The solvent will move from an area of a low tonicity to high tonicity. So remember low tonicity is things that are uh, kind of the um, particles that are stuck in that area and high. So if you have less particles stuck in one area and more particles stuck over here, the water is gonna to wanna to go over to the higher side, kind of dilute it. Um, remember the um, osmolarity of the red blood cell. Never inject water into someone. And when I say inject, I mean like through IV drip. And osmolarity is not the same as tonicity, which we discovered through the urea example. So even though urea and red blood cell have the same osmolarity, the same number of moles dissolved per whatever solute. Um, of, so they, because it's a, not a non-diffusible, it just diffuses straight into the cell. It brings with it that water. So it essentially has, it has a tonicity of zero, but an osmolarity of 300 or whatever. I know this will definitely be confusing because it's also a really hard thing to do without almost like drawing it out and with diagrams. But also with all the stuff that we would have learned today, there's no need to stress over all of this. Literally, if you know like hyper, hypo and isotonic things, um, that's all you have to know. And also it will make sense. Like if you just go over it slowly and also, especially after the lecture. Um, one thing I kind of did forget to mention, if we go back to actually my very, very first slide, sorry, like the intro slide. Yeah, keep going, sorry. Yeah, here. Oh, one sec, can you go one more back? Like, yeah, perfect. So hypertonic, how I remember this is, because I would always get confused between hyper or hypo. So I remember hypotonic as the as a cell like swelling, like water going into the cell. So if a cell cells, it's going to get bigger and it goes into like an O shape. So that's how I remember hypotonic. So it's like water going in the cell swelling. Um, but yeah, as I said, it might be very confusing now, but the more you'll, after the lecture especially, will make a lot more sense and feel free to message me any questions you have them now or even after later on. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I honestly thought we could open up the end of the session just a question and answer. Should we actually stop, we'll stop recording and then we'll do that, yeah.